My name is Justin O'Brien. I'm the director for the Center for Law, Markets, and Regulation at UNSW, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, here today. To begin, uh, I'd like to bring up uh, John Trowbridge, the interim director for the Center for International Finance and Regulation, which is a major center which has been funded by the federal government, the New South Wales state government, uh, industry, and is a consortium of six domestic universities, including and some international institutions, including UCLA itself. So with that, I'd like to hand over to John Trowbridge to give the formal introduction to Professor Stott's lecture. Thank you. John. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Professor Lynn Stout to, to, to this uh, event in Sydney. Today, she's giving her second lecture and seminar in the In Who or What Do We Trust series, What Do Shareholders Really Value? An event that, uh, that we, the Centre for International Finance and Regulation, as, uh, as uh, Justin explained, is proud to co-sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Lynn Stout. Thank you, Mr. Trowbridge, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you as well to the University of New South Wales and to the Center for Law, Markets, and Regulation, and to Justin O'Brien for arranging for me to speak here today. Um, it's, uh, I've been, I always am glad to come to Australia and Sydney in particular, which is just a delightful city to visit. But more than that, there are lots of exciting things going on here in terms of business and thinking about business. And so it's always nice for me to be exposed to the new ideas that are coming out from different parts of the world, especially Australia. Um, so I, I want to warn you today um, that uh, the topic I'm about to discuss is one that when I go in that direction, a lot of people tend to assume that I'm some sort of a communist. <laughs> uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I adore business. I'm deeply attached to it. I do not believe that successful societies can exist without a thriving business sector. At the same time, I also understand that free market is an oxymoron. A free market is a place where the biggest, strongest person bops you over the head and takes what they want. Markets cannot exist without law, and business cannot exist without law. And in order to understand what makes business contribute to social welfare, because of course, in my view, that's what business is about. It's about improving our lives. And by the way, it's brilliant at that when it's structured properly. But it has to be structured properly. And to do that, we need to be very realistic and very informed about what business really is. And my thesis today is that collectively, we may have made a dreadful mistake over the past 20, 30 years in misunderstanding what business really is and especially what the public corporation really is. And I want to give you an example, I think, of how that mistake has actually impeded the ability of business to make our lives better. And the example is BP. You probably remember that on April 20th and 2010, um, an oil well that BP was drilling in the Gulf of Mexico suddenly exploded. And the oil rig, the deep water horizon, went up in a column of fire that burned for two days before it finally collapsed into the depths of the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11 people and beginning the worst oil spill in, I believe, the history of humanity. This was a disaster on a scale that's very hard to imagine. Um, but it was especially a disaster for BP shareholders themselves. BP shares had been trading around $60 a share US before the Deepwater Horizon explosion. And within a month or so afterwards, they had been halved to $30 a share. A loss in BP's market capitalization of $100 billion. Of course, the calamity was by no means confined to reductions in the value of BP shares. BP bonds were also severely damaged as they were downgraded to almost junk bond status. Other oil companies' shares were harmed because in the wake of the spill, President Obama imposed a moratorium on all drilling in the Gulf, which of course is bad for all the other corporations that were seeking oil in the Gulf. 
It was bad for corporations that were in the tourism industry in the Gulf. It was bad for the fishing industry in the Gulf. It was bad for individuals who owned real estate in the area of the Gulf. It was bad for individuals who were employed in the fishing and the tourism industries in the Gulf. It was bad for people who like to eat fish from the Gulf. And it was bad for anyone who wanted to enjoy the recreational facilities of the Gulf ecosystem. And finally, it was obviously very bad for the Gulf ecosystem itself. How could a disaster happen on such a massive scale? The United States government organized a commission to investigate. And what they concluded was that the ultimate cause of the disaster was BP's desire to cut safety corners in order to save money. Each day that BP was drilling without putting the well into full operation was costing them $1 million. So in order to save $1 million a day, they ended up sacrificing $100 billion in shareholder wealth alone. No matter how you do the math, this was an enormous mistake. How could it have been made? My hypothesis is that one of the ultimate causes of the BP oil spill was what I call shareholder value thinking. And shareholder value thinking possesses the business world today, especially publicly listed companies. And it drives executives and directors to focus relentlessly on trying to get their share price up, not 10 years from now, not even five years from now, three months from now, tomorrow, if possible. And in the quest to raise share price, we see companies do what BP did. They cut safety corners. They reduce workplace safety. They make other poor decisions. They cut back on customer support. They reduce expenditures on research and development. Um, and a consulting firm in the United States published the results of a survey last year in which they interviewed chief financial officers of listed companies and said, would you undertake a, an investment in a project that would produce net present value, positive net present value over three to five years if you thought it would harm your quarterly earnings. And 85% of the CFOs said no, we would not make that long-term investment if it harmed our short-term ability to meet our earnings estimates. Not only do companies resist long-term investments, they fail to take adequate care of their customers. They fail to take adequate care of and to invest in their employees. They take on risks, and we've certainly seen this in the US financial center se sector. They leverage up their firms in the hopes that if things go well, they'll produce an enormous profit, and with the assurance that if things go very poorly indeed, much of the loss will be borne by their bondholders, by their customers, by their employees, but not ultimately by the shareholders themselves. Finally, in the US in particular, in the quest to raise share price, they actually manipulate the law itself. Uh, there's a story that uh, has not been told enough in the United States, I think, which is that in many ways we can trace the 2008 credit crisis to two changes in U.S. law that were driven by Enron and Citibank respectively. Citibank lobbied to eliminate restrictions on banks' abilities to speculate through proprietary trading divisions, and Enron lobbied to change the futures regulations laws so that for the first time in American business history, purely speculative futures trading off of an exchange became legal, and that was the origin of a $600 trillion derivatives market. So um, if we look at what this focus on share price has done, I think there's lots of reason to suspect it is actually preventing corporations from doing their best, not only for communities, for their employees, for their customers, but also possibly for investors as a class over time. So how did we get to shareholder value thinking? So this is really how I came to this project. I am a law professor. I study the law. And when I first went off teaching law, one of the things that drove me crazy was, of course, I, like probably virtually everyone in this room, had been taught that the purpose of the corporation is to maximize shareholder wealth, that shareholders are the ultimate owners of the corporation, and that ultimately they ought to exercise control. And if the boards of directors don't do what the shareholders want, then the shareholders ought to be able to step in and remove the boards. I mean, I, you know, this was, this was, as we say in America, mom, apple pie, and shareholder value. And I had no reason to doubt it when my professors taught it to me. It seemed sensible enough. Here's the problem. 
The more I taught law, the more I realized that's not what the law says. And indeed, 50 years ago, it's not what people in the business world believed. So let's step back in a time machine and go back to the 1940s and 1950s. If you were to interview the director of a public company in the 1940s or 1950s in America, and I don't, can't speak for Australia, but certainly this would be true for the large public corporations there, the AT&Ts, the General Electrics, and you were to ask directors, what's the purpose of the corporation? They would have said something like, that's a very complicated question. We serve many different interests. We want to develop a large successful firm, and that means we have to take care of our customers, we have to take care of our employees, we have to take care of our suppliers, we certainly have to take care of our investors, and we have to be good corporate citizens. Fast forward, get in your time machine, go to the year 2000, and if you were to ask most directors, they would say, oh no, we have one goal, maximizing shareholder wealth. How did that happen? It seems to have been the influence of an idea, or more specifically, an ideology, that as best I can trace it, came out of the University of Chicago in the 1970s and was led by, among others, the famed economist Milton Friedman. And there's this interesting intellectual history. It starts with Milton Friedman, who was a Nobel Prize winning economist, but I'll tell you, was no lawyer, <laughs> saying that shareholders own corporations. Now, how many people in the room are lawyers? I suspect we've got more than a few here. All right, then please back me up on this. Shareholders don't own corporations. Corporations are independent legal entities that own themselves, just like you own yourself. What do shareholders own? Well, the name tells you they own shares. And what is a share? It's a contract between the shareholder and the corporation that gives shareholders very limited rights. Just like bondholders enter a contract with the corporation that gives them limited rights, and employees enter contracts with corporations that give them limited rights. So from a legal perspective, Milton Friedman's claim that shareholders own corporations was wrong from the get-go. Yet, somehow this notion turned out to have tremendous appeal. It had tremendous appeal to economists because it gave them a simple story that also gave them a metric for measuring corporate performance. If you think that shareholders are the owners, or as more sophisticated economists would put it, the residual claimants, then you have an easily measurable corporate objective. The idea is, as long as you maximize the share value of the firm, you've maximized the social contributions that the firm makes. Because everyone else, according to economic theory, gets only what their contracts provide them. Bondholders get interest payments, employees get their salaries, but they're not entitled to and they shouldn't receive anything else. Shareholders as owners should get every penny that's of profit that's left over after the firm has paid off the fixed claims of its other participants. And if you're an economist, you say, this is brilliant. All we have to do to make recommendations about the best way to govern firms is to figure out what you can do that can raise the share price at firms, and we've got ourselves a tidy, tidy little business in economic consulting. So the consultants, the, eco the economists and the economic consultants, loved this idea, and business journalists and a lot of professors loved the idea too because it makes corporations very easy to understand. It almost analogizes them to a sole proprietorship. And anyone can understand a sole proprietorship. So if you talk about corporations as if they're owned by shareholders, as if shareholders are the residual claimants, as if shareholders are principals who hire agents, then suddenly a very complex institution that I personally think of as being more comparable to a nation state suddenly gets reduced to something that you can explain in a paragraph to your students, to your readers if you're a journalist, to your business school students if you're a business school professor. The problem is, and, and this is what I found so frustrating when I began to teach and to a more limited extent as a member of a board of trustees, which is the equivalent of a board of directors, I began to experience it in the business world. It simply didn't describe the reality that I saw. So what was the reality that I saw? Well, the first thing I've already mentioned, which is that as a legal matter, it is completely misleading to describe shareholders as owners of firms. They're not. They are 
people who enter contracts with firms just as bondholders, employees, suppliers enter contracts with firms. What about this notion that shareholders are entitled to all the profits left over after other firm participants have been paid, or as an economist would put it, that shareholders are the residual claimants? Well, it turns out that's only an accurate description of dead firms that are being liquidated. It's not an accurate description of living firms at all. What happens in living firms? Well, actually, shareholders do not get a penny unless the directors decide to declare a dividend. They're not in any realistic sense entitled to take all of the profits. They have to wait for the directors to give it to them. Now, at this point, I always get a very sensible finance student who puts up her hand and says, oh, Professor Stout, but it doesn't matter if the directors don't declare dividends. As you may, and as you may know, in the US, they frequently don't. Dividends are a much bigger part of business life in the UK and in Australia than they are in the States. But my students would say, it doesn't matter if the directors don't declare dividends, because, of course, then the earnings will be retained by the firm, and the value of the shares will rise. So at the end of the day, the shareholders get the benefit anyway. At which point, I turn to my student and I say, very good. I'm glad you've taken finance. Now you need to go take an accounting course. Because if you take accounting, you'll very quickly learn that retained earnings is an accounting concept. And of course, earnings are nothing more than revenues minus expenses. Oh, and by the way, who controls the expenses? It's not the shareholders. It is, again, the board of directors. So there's only profits for the shareholders if the directors want there to be. And if instead, if the firm's got tons of revenues rolling in, and the directors say, but we want to give some of this money to the employees in the form of a raise. And we want to give our executives access to a Learjet. By the way, if you want, I'm perfectly happy to defend the executive jet to anyone. It's much cheaper than giving them stock options. Give them a jet if it makes them happy. And they even get more work done that way. So, so I don't understand this anti-jet thing, um, even though I myself fly coach. And I'm envious as the rest of you, but really, it, jets are not so bad. Um, uh, in any case, um, the directors can say, we're going to build up a cash cushion, which, by the way, benefits the creditors, along with the shareholders. They say, we can donate money the, to the community. So what happens in reality in successful corporations is that when the corporation's doing very well, there are lots of groups that benefit, along with shareholders. And by the way, when the corporation's doing poorly, there are lots of groups that have to bear the cost. So, when you've got a bad year, you say, sorry, executives, the jets go on your flying coach. You tell the employees, oh, your health benefits are going to be cut back. No more dental insurance for you. You cut back on your philanthropic contributions, and the equity cushion gets worn thin, and the creditors suffer. That's the way living firms operate. I think it's a tremendous mistake to judge the role of shareholders by what happens in dead firms that are being liquidated. That's like judging the use of a horse by what happens to dead horses, right? Live horses are athletes and pets. Dead horses are pet food. Don't confuse the two functions. All right. And live corporations are different from dead corporations. Um, so finally, let's get to this notion that is very common among economists that shareholders are principals who control directors as their agents. Again, the lawyers in the room, this is legally completely wrong. In law, principals are people who want to accomplish something, who hire agents to do the job for them, subject to their control. Now, this is very interesting because it presumes that the principal comes before the agent. And it presumes that the principal controls the agent. That's not the way corporations come first. As a matter of law, the corporation and the board of directors appears long before there's a shareholder on the horizon. You have to incorporate the firm, and you have to select a board of directors before there's anyone in a position to enter a contract with shareholders and sell shares. How can you possibly have a principle that's created after the agents created? It's the other way around. And of course, boards of directors are not controlled by shareholders in a typical publicly listed firm. Now, here I must mention that the arguments that I'm making apply primarily to publicly listed firms and not to privately listed firms with controlling shareholders. Firms with controlling shareholders, which are, of course, the model in most of the world, especially outside the United States, are quite a different animal. And 
in a sense, you can say that if you've got a controlling shareholder, you're moving closer to this notion of shareholder ownership because that controlling shareholder has much more influence over the board through the power to remove them relatively easily. However, interestingly enough, the data shows that these privately managed or privately controlled firms actually, ironically, tend to make decisions that are more long-term and more socially responsible than the publicly listed firms. And I'm going to explain why in a few minutes. Now let's go back to these publicly listed firms where there's this enormous pressure that we're placing on directors, not coming from the law, but coming actually from our ideology of what we think directors should do. These enormous pressures to maximize shareholder value. Um, well, it turns out that that pressure has got no basis in corporate law itself. Because if you look at the rules of corporate law, although you can find dicta in some cases where judges have offhandedly said things like, oh, well, directors owe duty to shareholders, I can also show you plenty of cases that say directors also owe duties to this entity called the firm. And in the United States, I can give you cases that say, oh, and while they're looking after the firm, directors have the discretion to look after other constituencies, employees, suppliers, consumers. But the key point from a legal perspective is that this is all dicta, or as we legal types call it, mere dicta, meaning it's not binding in any way. In law, what matters is not dicta, not the offhand remark. In law, what matters is what we call the holding, what the judge makes you do at the end of the day. And in both the US and Australia, at the end of the day, judges don't make directors maximize shareholder value. Instead, they defer to something called the business judgment rule that says, as long as directors are not using their powers to line their own pockets, as long as they're not stealing from the firm, it's up to the board to decide what the corporation ought to do. And this pattern, by the way, is reflected in corporate charters themselves. Another source of corporate law, in quotes, that I think is very neglected, is what the corporate charter says about corporate purpose. And in most states in the United States, there's actually a requirement that you describe the corporate purpose in the charter. I have never seen a charter that says the purpose of this corporation is to maximize shareholder value. It may exist out there, but after years of looking at charters, I've never seen it. What you do see over and over is the following. The purpose of the corporation is to do anything lawful. So both in the internal law of corporate charters and the external law of case law, what we see is that corporate law has evolved to preserve enormous discretion on the part of directors to choose purposes other than maximizing shareholder value. It is a mistaken view that many directors have. And I think we can attribute this view to, I, I do think we academics get much of the blame because since the days of Milton Friedman, we've been teaching our students in law schools and business schools that they need to maximize shareholder value. But that's not, in fact, what the law says. And it doesn't seem to be working out all that well. The more business goes in the direction of convincing our directors we need to maximize shareholder value, let's just say there's no evidence it's helping. I'm, you know, when I'm feeling ambitious, I may go further and say, you know, I can't prove it, but I suspect it's hurting. But let me talk about the evidence we've got. Um, because of this uh, embrace of shareholder value thinking, we have a generation of economists and legal scholars who thought, well, this is a lovely theory. Let's go out and prove it's true. And boy, have they tried. They have tortured the data until it screamed. And yet, there is a remarkable lack of any reliable, replicated evidence that corporations that are run according to the principles of shareholder value actually produce better results for shareholders, never mind anybody else. So one of my favorite examples is in the United States, um, about, I think it's now 7 or 8% of firms have what we call dual class shares, where you've got the founders of the company who have one class of shares that have 10 times the voting power of the public shareholders. Now, if you believe in conventional shareholder primacy theory, you would say that's a dreadful situation because the 10% of the shareholders who control all the votes often tend to be the executives and the top managers of the corporation. You'd say that should be a dreadful system. They should produce dreadful returns for shareholders. Well, there's no evidence that that's true, and there's actually some evidence 
that firms that have dual class capitalization outperform firms with one share, one vote if you look at long term results and if you look at their ability to avoid collapsing. Uh, firms that have one share, one vote are more fragile and tend to run into trouble more often and also don't tend to have as good long term operating results. But more broadly, I think that by looking at the performance of individual companies, we're actually looking at the wrong phenomenon. I call this the problem of fishing with dynamite. So let me give you an analogy. Suppose you wanted to figure out the best fishing technique. And you might go out and say, oh, there are fishermen who use bait. for They use, you know, they use I don't know, worms for bait. And there are fishermen who use um, lures for bait. And if we want to find out the best way to fish, what we're going to do is run an empirical study to see if you get more fish by fishing with uh, worms or fishing with lures. Um, and at first, that seems like a very sensible way to test what's the best way to fish, right? But what if one of the fishermen figures out that he can fish with dynamite? Well, what are your empirical studies going to show? They're going to show that anyone who switches from fishing to worms to fishing with dynamite gets lots more fish. And you're also going to see that the overall fish catch goes up dramatically in the short term. But what's going to happen to fishing in the long term? Well, we've tried this in lots of communities, and we know what tends to happen when you let people fish with dynamite is eventually you run out of fish. And my concern is that something very similar may be going on in the business world. By Embracing the ideology of shareholder value and encouraging corporate directors and corporate executives to do something, anything, to raise share price at a particular firm tomorrow, we are actually making it harder and harder for the corporate sector as a whole to produce long-term returns for investors. And, you know, as I, I will be the first person to admit there's no way I can prove that the dreadful returns that US investors in particular have suffered in the last 10 years, which by the way, we now call the lost decade in the United States. Investor returns have been almost flat. I can't prove that shareholder value thinking is a direct cause because there's so many other possible causes, but the logical connection is there. If the short-term pursuit of a share, higher share price harms long-term returns, both for the shareholders of that company and for the shareholders of other companies and for the economy as a whole, you would expect to see what we have seen, which is that the increasing embrace of shareholder thinking, especially as reflected in executive compensation plans, has produced a flattening of economic growth, investment, and shareholder returns along with it. All right. Um, so where do we stand intellectually? Where we stand intellectually, oh my gosh, I'm almost done. How did that happen? All right, I'm going to leap to the chase. I've done the most important part. Where we stand intellectually, I think, is it's time for us as people who believe in business to sit back and say, we believe in business, but we also believe in reality. And if we look at the reality, our theories of what makes business work don't seem to be working. There's something wrong with the theory. We need a new theory. Well, I was going to spend a lot of time talking about possible new theories, but I see I've run out of time. But I'll just hint at the one I think I have found a useful wedge to get people started thinking. And that is, why is shareholder value going wrong? My working hypothesis is we don't understand what shareholders are. Shareholder is a fiction. I actually have a reverse view. A lot of people think that corporations are fictions and shareholders are real. I think that's backwards. Corporations are real. They may be invisible, but any lawyer will tell you, as legal entities, they're very real. They own property. They commit torts. They enter contracts. The shareholder is a fiction. Shareholders are human beings. The idea that there's some mythical shareholder there that cares only about the price of Qantas stock and nothing else is a mistake. Hedge fund managers come close, but the rest of us have lots of interests. And they include, we're not just interested in what happens to Qantas stock tomorrow. We're interested in what happens to Qantas stock 10 years from now. Because if you're saving for retirement, if it's your super, I guess you call it here, it's that long term you're thinking about.
we're not just interested in Qantas's ability to get a short-term rise in share price by pressing down wages. We're also interested in making sure that Qantas has a good, positive, long-term relationship with labor. Now, it may be labor in another part of the world, but if you're interested in Qantas's long-term success and in the success of other businesses, you need to keep labor and suppliers and other constituencies at the table contributing to firms. We're interested not just in the price of Qantas stock, but if you're a diversified shareholder, you care about all the other Australian firms whose businesses were disrupted when Qantas stopped flying. So Qantas stock went up and everybody else's stock went down because their business executives couldn't get where they were going and their supplies and their products couldn't get where they were going. And finally, and I love this part, if you want to talk about this, I'd be delighted to talk about this. Another area that I do research in is moral behavior. And as you may have gathered, I actually think successful business and moral behavior are deeply related. And in my study of moral behavior, I have good news for you. Most of us aren't psychopaths. <laughs> because, of course, homo economicus is. The rare entity that truly cares about nothing but his or her own material gain is technically called a psychopath. And I'm pleased to report that most of us actually would prefer to get slightly reduced shareholder returns as, say, shareholders of Union Carbide if our companies would avoid blowing up an Indian village and killing 2,000 and maiming 10,000 more. So the reality is, if you look at the data, there's every reason to think that shareholders, as human beings, also want their corporations to be socially responsible. But that's not something shareholders can do. Oh, sorry, that's not something corporations can do when you relentlessly press them to raise share price at any cost. Okay, have I caused enough trouble, Justin? I hope so. Um, but I think I'll simply close by saying, I think the moral of the story is that ideas matter. And John Maynard Keynes actually told us about this uh, many years ago where he wrote that practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. I fear we have allowed ourselves, and by ourselves I mean the business community, the investing community, and the community community, to become slaves of a defunct economic idea that it's well past time to revisit. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lynn, for that uh, highly interesting and controversial, uh, I'm sure, to people uh, presentation. What we wanted to do was to, to unpack the argument. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so we've assembled uh, a, a very distinguished panel. Let me inter introduce them uh, going across the table. We have uh, David Vines, Professor of Economics at the University of Oxford, who's just told me he has been up half the night uh, liaising with the IMF in terms of how to fix Europe? Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure he's pretty tired this morning. Uh, but <laughs> uh, You're not alone. <laughs> beside him is uh, uh, Greg Medcraft, uh, who you all know is the chairman of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. And then we have John Colvin, the uh, chief executive officer of uh, the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Uh, Professor Seamus Miller from the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. It's and at the end of the oral. table, we have uh, John Morgan, who you all know, who is a, a, a partner here at Allen's. And I want to thank Allen's for its hospitality in allowing us to use these fabulous premises uh, this morning. Uh, what I've asked each of the panelists to do is to give a five minute initial response uh, to Professor yeah. Stott's lecture, and then we'll open it up to interactive questions from the floor. So if I can begin, I suppose, well, well let's begin at the level of the firm and the director, John Colvin. Right, I thought I might have had a bit of a briefer introduction, but I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I read the, uh, Professor Stott's uh, paper, and um, I thought it was a, a very, very good paper. Lots of really interesting aspects to it, and lots of things which resonate, um, I think, in the day-to-day -day operations of directors. So um, given that I'm in Allen's, I'll be uh, quite circumspect in putting out any law, but um, mm -hmm. I understand from my studies of mm -hmm. law that in Australia the, the duties um, of a director are to the corporation itself. Um, and in a lot of the discussions and cases and the way we teach, um, if you have a duty to the corporation, yeah, yeah. 
Um, that doesn't necessarily <laughs> encompass a unilateral economic view mm -hmm. of um, shareholder value only. And in fact, the discussions and the cases talk about variously the sort of things really that we're just that um, professors have been talking about. But um, and a, a a director really has to. One of the hardest parts of being a director is dealing with all these competing um, issues with staff, consumers, um, politicians, political issues, um, and shareholders. However, the fundamental, I guess, thing in all of that is, um, I think Don Argus put it well, although he was criticised in, in an article recently, because um, I didn't talk about the, his, his premise to get there, is one of, the, one of the issues for a director and executive team is to be given a pot of money from uh, shareholders, bondholders, etc., and then do their best to increase that over time. And the issue really is, I think, as you've adequately and very eloquently put, increase that over time. That means that you might have to take hits in the short term. Mm -hmm. That means that you might have to make investment decisions or make decisions which don't um, actually help the quarterly figures. But in the long term, and the view um, that certainly we espouse is directors are there to look after and steward the, the company over a long period of time for the benefit of long-term shareholders and long-term uh, investors and also the community itself and the employees and other stakeholders. Now there's lots of interesting law about that which people far more eloquent than me and better informed can probably talk about that. But that seems to be the generally accepted view in Australia. So um, I'm not sure whether Milton Friedman, although he, I did economics for about five years and I learnt there were cycles, um, I don't think, and I haven't been able to pick any of them by the way, um, and, but I don't think Milton Friedman's view in, in Australia is as pronounced you know, in, in the Australian context. I think it's far more probably to where um, you would go. Then, um, but it does raise a, a lot, number of other issues, which is um, we had a period where, um, a long period in the 50s and 60s, where shareholding was pretty diverse and management didn't really have to concern themselves too much, or to the extent that they do now, about dealing with individual shareholders. Um, and then since in Australia, with superannuation and, and fund managers, et cetera, et cetera, that um, coalition or that bringing together of uh, shareholder groups, as you say, um, has brought in, I think, pressures um, which are far more intense now on directors about dealing um, certainly with shareholders. The, the problem there for directors, though, gets a bit, a bit more woolly, which is um, which shareholders are you meant to be dealing with? Um, and some of you may have seen the report we put out recently on institutional shareholding and um, about working out, well, so who does a director go and deal with in the event that they have an issue they want to discuss with um, shareholders. One of the examples in Australia, because we're a bit obsessed about it, is executive remuneration. So who did the directors go and talk about to get the, value, the view of the shareholders, given that we have a system which I don't think anyone else in the world has, where we have the two strikes legislation, you've probably heard about that, where um, if you get more than 25% vote against in, in two meetings, then um, you have to then hold the meeting for the whole board to be spilled. Um, so the question is, who do the directors go and talk to about getting this? And you've got a disaggregation of, of people with shares. Now, I was told, and I don't know whether this is true, so somebody in the audience probably knows this, that for every share in a major listed company, there's about 10 contracts out on various yeah. shares. So there's a put option, there's, an, there's another option, um, there's a, a loan for a vote, there's a sale of a this. And so you've got whole lots of disaggregation of a particular vote. Then you have disaggregation of um, what are the shareholders, who are they, um, and that gets down to hedge fund operators, long-term mums and dads, small um, superannuation funds or self-managed superannuation funds, long-term investors. Um, and I understand from a speech that David Gonski gave, who's the chairman of the ASX, that the average holding of a share in Australia at the moment is 20 minutes. So. Um, this is posing, I think, quite some challenges for directors about who, in the where they have to um, talk to shareholders, which ones they talk to. Um, then you also have the, the disaggregation of those who advise on, on voting behaviour, those who then decide, and then those who have the ultimate say in that. And that's 
an area where we have suggested that um, there needs to be more work from directors, institutions, etc., to, to try and make sure there's better communication in this area. So that's, I guess, one of the one of the areas. Um, the the other area I think that we you raised at the very beginning, which I think we shouldn't lose sight of, is that. I think it was described uh, as the greatest invention, one of the greatest inventions ever, the, the limited liability company. Um, our standard of living in Australia and elsewhere in the world depends pretty heavily on, quite frankly, that invention. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the state, the statement was, and I can't remember it exactly, it was, it's a better, it's a greater invention than even the electric light and lots of other things. Um, because uh, the, if you look at the tax revenue, uh, in Australia, and I don't know what it is in the United States, but if you look at the tax revenue in Australia, that coming from corporations, basically if that goes, so does the economy. Um, I say that, but um, you rarely hear that said by um, a lot of other people because it's not necessarily a view which people want to hear, but um, if you take away PAYE tax, corporate tax, GST and a few others, there's not a hell of a lot left. So the, the value of corporate life and the 2.1 million directors in Australia, which is not just in the listed space, but in the not-for-profits, the charities, et cetera, et cetera, um, is a fundamental issue for us uh, as directors, as organisations, a fundamental direct issue for the whole of society. So um, I think I might stop there because um, I could go on too long about various other things. Okay. John, thanks very much. John Morgan. Well, I suppose I can speak as a lawyer. I think John um, has outlined what I think is the, the primary uh, a normal way of framing the duty of directors in Australia. Um, that is, it's a duty to the company and the courts are saying that consistently now. Um, but then the question of other interests and clearly directors are able to take into account other interests but in terms of what interests must they take into account it's normally um, looked at in terms of the requirement to take into account creditor interests in impending insolvency. But I think if we actually look at the framework of our law, that's not right. And I think it, 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 that examination leads to a, another way of considering the role of directors in our community. And that is because our law contains a number of obligations. Um, the, the, the type of obligation which may be similar to the traffic offence of not stopping at a red light. And those obligations are imposed upon companies. In some cases, they're imposed directly on directors. And I think we saw in Centro recently the obligation on the director to sign um, the declaration relating to the accounts. Um, it really doesn't involve a duty to the company, it's an obligation on the director. And those obligations are formed by government and I'm not sure that they're really thought about in a whole of um, society or whole of economy point of view. They tend to be, uh, be generated by particular uh, objectives or interests or, or the like. Environmental laws is a very good example. But if we step back and now look at the position of directors, more often than not, what we're seeing in the courts is directors being held liable in various ways in respect of these obligations and the duty provisions are, are in part generating that liability. So we see cases of directors um, being liable directly for a breach of an obligation imposed on them uh, and we find that in some, in some laws. We find directors being liable because they're knowingly involved in a breach of obligation by the company, the accessorial liability. And we also see more often directors being liable for permitting or allowing a company to breach an obligation. And that permission or allowance is framed as a breach of their duty to the company. So in one way, from a lawyer's perspective, um, directors are sitting in a, in, a, in a situation where they've got to look at where they may be liable. And the question then arises as to whether or not the setting of all those obligations are properly framed having regard to where we really want companies to go and uh, what we want them to do and how they work within our economic system. And I'm not sure that thinking process is actually there at the moment. I think we have a whole lot of disparate things. 
And that leads in turn to the problem that directors face in uh, dealing with these matters. So I think that in a way, um, the reality of directors is they're not really faced with shareholder primacy. What they're faced is with a large mix of obligations in the context of their duties. Um, and I think that um, in that context, the director's, duty, uh, director's role is quite difficult. And I think, I, I, I agree with John, I mean, so my conversation with directors, I think directors do get the message. They do understand they've got to have regard to other interests. And, I, and certainly speaking to some senior directors, they are really focused on long-term sustainable value. And given that superannuation uh, investment now in Australia is very large in our corporate community, um, that must be one of the prime objectives of those those who are ultimately the economic beneficiaries of shares, and they certainly don't own them, but the, that is the, the, the members of super funds. Um, and one wonders whether um, the issue about shareholders has is, 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 is become so difficult because of the fact they're sort of this ephemeral moving group who you can never know from day to day who they might be. And in many circumstances, the people who vote are not the people who really have um, the, the economic interests that lie behind the shares. So that's my perception as a lawyer as to where we are at the moment. Okay, John, thanks very much. Greg. Yeah, look, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Stout, for your work today. I think it was uh, very thought-provoking. Uh, I'll pass it back to my commission. Uh, I think this discussion is relevant to ASIC's strategic priorities. I think, in particular, the first outcome, which is confident and informed investors and financial consumers. It's very relevant, particularly in the areas of education and, and gatekeepers. I'll talk about that. Um, and also our second outcome, which is fair and efficient financial markets, because the two inter interact. But I think here there's really, I see, three uh, relevant issues. One, corporate accountability. Two, shareholder activism. And three, director responsibility. In terms of corporate accountability, I think, as Professor Sout said, uh, the law does not prescribe the directors must do whatever raises the share price. The requirement is that it's got to be in the best interest of the corporation. I think now we see a number of corporations now speak uh, not of stakeholders uh, in addition to shareholders. So I think you are seeing an emerging a change in society. Um, you also even hear about shareholders talking about a company's social license to operate. And I think we see now, you know, around the world, the emergence of reporting in respect of environment, you know, environmental and social reporting is, I think, a, a very significant trend. And I think that. So I think you, there is a, I think the law often, you see an expectation gap emerging and I think we're seeing, you know, I think the community is actually focusing a lot more on, on, uh, on that. I think also uh, while the focus maximising uh, short term share price can produce out adverse outcomes, I actually think companies should focus on maximising long term shareholder value because I think that that generally results in an alignment in terms of you know, basically all stakeholders benefiting. And just in terms of the comment, I think at the end of the day, having been in investment banking, uh, you know, I think the market focuses on, on very, the market actually adjusts in terms of things, p the PE ratio I think is something very important because generally, as we all know, that if you can achieve an increase in earnings, but in fact, if the market actually thinks that those earnings are not sustainable, it adjusts your PE ratio down. So. If you're looking at long-term value, you, you know, most good companies look at their PE ratio and I think what we saw in banking is that if in fact the market felt that your earnings were not sustainable or your model wasn't sustainable, you might be earning high uh, returns but your PE ratio would decline. So, you know, I think that there is a very important, I think you've, you've got to look at the quality and sustainability of those earnings. So, you know, I think corporate accountability is very important. Companies and di their directors are important gatekeepers. In terms of shareholder activism, uh, you know, I note many of Australian institutional investors are active investors. Uh, unlike the United States, Australian institutional investors are not required by law to vote their shares. But um, since uh, the 90s and the work, I think, of institutions like the Financial Services Council, um, fund managers and superannuation funds have developed a culture of taking voting seriously. Um, in fact, I think to be a member of the FSC, I think you have to agree to, to, uh, to, be, to vote your shares at meetings. 
Uh, so I think it, there is a, a, a culture of being active, and I think, and I think it's important that they are active because, to me, institutional investors are also gatekeepers because they manage the public's money, and they manage people's money. So I think it's very important they actually maintain, uh, you know, their role in terms of, you know, making sure they actually have proper uh, vigilance in terms of what corporations are actually doing so I think it's actually quite important in terms of you know them as gatekeepers and another aspect of activism I think is is the corporate governance advisors I, I think frankly they're a good phenomena uh, but I think what's important with uh, proxy advisors I think that it would be good if perhaps they're clearer about you know in terms of being transparent about the uh, the methodologies they use about how they train their staff and uh, also uh, perhaps their accessibility. But on the other hand, I think it's important to for corporations uh, to explain how they use proxy advisors uh, and when uh, when they when they're deciding how to vote, how they actually use the advice they've got. So and finally, in terms of director responsibility, Centro. I'm happy you mentioned Centro. Uh, I think, fran frankly, uh, Centro, I think, reconfirmed the importance of directors meeting their responsibilities. And as I've said before, you know, three things that directors should take away from Centro is scepticism, that basically they should challenge constructively what is presented to them by management. Secondly, accounting knowledge. If they don't understand the financial statements, which are the life finance is the lifeblood of a company, then they perhaps should get some training. And thirdly, accountability and control. At the end of the day, uh, the, share, the directors are those that are responsible for the company and they need to make sure that, uh, you know, that they have, a, have in place the right systems of, of accountability and control. So as I said before, I think today's discussion is very relevant to, uh, to ASIC in terms of our strategic framework. And uh, I, uh, I like to um, have a debate, but I, I think I largely, uh, I think there's a lot of sympathy with many of the, the points you're making, actually, Professor Stout. Okay, thank you. Uh, this clearly has an impact on the academy as well. So we have um, um, David Vines uh, representing the economics profession um, and uh, Seamus Miller, uh, philosophy and uh, applied ethics. Uh, let's begin with, uh, with David. Thank you very much for organising this meeting and thank you, Lynn, for writing such a good book. It's, it, it's a remarkably good book in that it's a very good read and it's also underpinned by very firm analysis. And it's not often that you find things that are both of those. And I have to say that the other book which Lynn referred to, Cultivating Conscience, is a pleasure in a similar way. I want to say four things. Uh, that this book and your talk this morning describes, I think, the way things are Secondly, I want to talk briefly about why. Thirdly, I want to just describe what a challenge it is to fix. And fourthly, a hint on how. And that's a lot in five minutes, I'll be quick. First of all, things are like this. The Qantas story is a very good one. Um, so is Southern Cross Healthcare in the UK. Both are targeted by hedge funds whose task was to do a highly leveraged buy out, take out the capital, leave these with as very leveraged firms, subject to the risk of difficulty. Of course, all the Qantas planes would have been owned by someone in Singapore, and we would have been walk walking to Sydney from Melbourne. Now, in the end, there would have been somebody else run the planes. That's externalizing costs. Secondly, Southern Cross Healthcare, highly leveraged, there was a scandal in that along the way some third-rate, second-tier managers, six of them, each got two million payoffs to organise this. But the real issue was that 30,000 old people in Britain were terrified in not knowing whether their health care was going to close, their, their accommodation was going to close next week. Why? Uh, you have to realise that both the, the deal for Qantas and Southern Cross they didn't turn these firms into trash, otherwise the hedge fund couldn't have got out. They turned them into what risk neutral think, what people would think is a pretty good deal. And you know, if it goes down, well, we're diversified. And, and it's not very good to tell the pensioners, sorry, diversification means that actually people don't care much. That's externalizing costs. Now this is one very specific uh, 
way of reading Lynn's message. So this stuff matters. Second, why are we here? I think it goes much further back than uh, Milton Friedman. I was Adam Smith Professor of Economics in Glasgow before I moved to Oxford. This is Adam Smith's invisible hand. Uh, what we teach our students is that markets are efficient. That's the first basic theorem of welfare economics. And then we do in the course all that important stuff about monopoly, externalities, moral hazard, uh, adverse selection. And that's what, that's what you're about, fixing that stuff. And, and all our students go out thinking that that's how the world is. Now, um, the, 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 um, what a, where's the firm in that stuff that I teach my students? Well, it's an agent just like the individuals. The individuals maximise utility and the firms maximise profits. And what's more, the, all these models have the profit maximisation feeding stuff to the individuals so that globally this is a welfare maximum, apart from all these things which we teach our students. Um, th th this is why we're there is Adam Smith's invisible hand. And my profession told everyone that that was cool and efficient markets theory was right and let's get on with it. I've been wor doing work on financial reform. This is a much bigger issue than finance, but it pins straight into the financial reform. So, so we're guilty is why we're there. Thirdly, what to do? Well, it's difficult. And I, I, I tell you why. You know, we talked to Lynn about this last night at dinner. It's difficult for the following reason. Nick Morris and the audience and I are leading a, a group, a wonderful interdisciplinary group of philosophers, historians, uh, economists, whatever, lots of people, thinking about the duty of care in finance, what to do about the ethics of financial reform. And what we've identified is that the employees of financial firm may act, do act, have acted in ways which is not in the interest of their customers. Uh, they, 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 um, they do churn, they do high remuneration for themselves, they have a fantastically good skill at devising tail risk assets which mainly pay off and yield them fees, two and twenty, but just sometimes tank and take out everything that the investors own and just guess what, they just don't get their two and twenty that year. Now, now um, so so, so the conclusion is, is in these firms, the employees may exploit the customers and clients. Now, guess what? Until reading Lynn's book, I thought, well, you know, what I got taught in graduate school was that shareholders fixed that. Uh, the shareholders are the guys who stop this stupid behaviour being carried out by the managers. And in some sense, that still is underpinning some of Nick and Mai's thinking. And that thinking's run aground after reading uh, Lynn's book. So final remark, uh, what to do. And it echoes uh, quite a bit about what Lynn said and the other th three people have said. I, I think that this will only happen when two things are at the centre of understanding. First of all, that the managers and their emp employees become professionalised. That hasn't been part of any of the discussion today, except very obliquely. Uh, doctors are professionalised. Lawyers, in a way, are. Uh, accountants, uh, uh, architects can get thrown out of the profession for acting in an unprofessional manner. Uh, and secondly, that it should be the task of corporate governance to make the firms a place where professional employees can flourish. Now, I would agree with what has been said earlier, but notice that that wasn't described as one of the duties of directors. And I think it's extremely important that that becomes one of the duty of directors. Now we go back to Southern Cross and Qantas. What, what was wrong with that, that? Was it that the boards were just, sh sh um, were just short sighted? Well, no. Uh, they, they got out on Southern Cross, they sold it all right, the hedge fund made a lot of money. Uh, so Lynn says, well, they should have had an obligation to keeping those care firms going. This wasn't just an operation for a hedge fund. This was old age care. Now, 
keeping old age care going is an economic objective with long-term aspect. I think one might need to go one stage further and say our objective, you know, Qantas II, is to make a, a Southern Cross Care a place in which people who work feel proud of being professionals who do old age care. And that's one stage further than making sure that Southern Cross survives as an old age care organisation. And, and, so I, and, and I think that it must be the task of boards of governors, must, that I'm, I'm aware I'm in a, a, a legal building and must is a strong word, I believe it would be an advantage to work in this direction and to have the, he the law help us work in this direction where it becomes one of the obligations of boards of directors that to help their companies be companies of this kind. Thanks. Chairman. Uh, yeah, well let me first thank Lynn for a very uh, interesting and provocative, perhaps in some context, lecture and also thank uh, Justin for uh, organising this meeting. Justin's asked me to speak about uh, purpose uh, and specifically the purpose of uh, corporations. And as a, as a philosopher, and perhaps particularly in the light of what's happening in Europe and Greece, I thought I'd invoke uh, Aristotle at this point, since he's the philosopher par excellence who's focused on purpose. According to Aristotle, you can't really work out what you ought to do. You can't really uh, work out what an organisation's structure ought to be, what its management's policies ought to be, uh, or anything much else, until you figure out what its purpose is. That is, what is the good uh, that that organisation or the market or whatever it else is in question has been established to achieve. So the question uh, resolves itself for Aristotle in relation to corporations is what is the purpose of corporations? Why do we have them? What is the good that they produce? And the same, uh, same set of questions pertains to any particular occupation, lawyers, auditors, academics uh, or any other group. Um, I agree with uh, Lynn Stout uh, that uh, simply ascribing as the primary or sole purpose uh, shareholder value for corporations uh, is, is, is not correct and in fact it seems to me to confuse uh, institutional means with institutional ends. The ultimate uh, ends of corporations aren't to reward shareholders, they're not to reward uh, uh, managers, they're not to provide salaries to, uh, to the people who work in those corporations. Uh, those are all means to an end. Th those rewards are simply the means by which we try to uh, ensure that the corporation actually achieves its purposes. Uh, they may be the specific motives of shareholders, of, of uh, people who are employed and so on, but that's not the purpose of the entity. To figure out what the purpose of the entity is, we've got to, I think, revert to, um, to Adam Smith uh, at this point, another uh, important philosopher. Um, and essentially what Smith would say, I think, is that the purpose of having a director, the purpose of having a lawyer, the purpose of an auditor, the purpose of an employee and so on, has to be seen in the context of what the purpose of the organisation is. What, is the, what does the organisation exist to do? And the organisation itself needs to be thought in terms of the market to which it is a participating contributor. And essentially what he would have suggested, I think, is that if, if we're talking about a car market, the purpose is to produce uh, a, an adequate supply of high quality cars at minimum cost. The purpose of a capital market is to, is to produce an adequate supply of minimal, uh, minimally priced capital. That's, that's, the, that's the raison d'etre, that's the reason we have these things. If we work back from that hypothesis about the purpose of the market, we can see what the purpose of a particular corporation might be and we can see what the purpose of a particular role in such a corporation uh, might be. So if we move then uh, to corporations in particular, they're a specific organisational form. They have a specific, they're not the same as partnerships, they're not the same as private firms. So we've got to ask ourselves why have corporations, why have these particular kinds of organisation, for example, that have limited liability? And I take it that uh, part of the answer is that they serve general purposes according to the market, as Smith would have us uh, would have us believe that is that these organisations compete in a market marketplace and they maximise uh, quality and minimise cost and provide an adequate supply of cars, capital or whatever else it is that we want that market to <coughs> produce. However, the specific form, that specific organisational form that the corporation takes is presumably uh, itself 
to be justified, and I take it that part of the justification, at least historically, is that when it came to fairly large-scale long-term projects, you needed, which needed a large amount of capital, the way to achieve that was, in fact, to have limited liability companies, shareholders, and whatnot. So if that's the particular purpose of, of that uh, organisational form, the corporation, then of course we would need to ask ourselves whether or not it's achieving its purpose, whether or not it's fit for purpose, particularly in the context of what uh, Lynn Stout has been telling us, that actually these beasts that we've produced to serve long-term large-scale projects are actually fixated with short-term shareholder value. Because if that's the case, then they're not actually fit for purpose. Uh, the final point I'd make here is that in relation to certain sorts of uh, organisational activities and professional activities, um, it may be that these stand in some tension with the market uh, hypothesis to start off with, not simply with uh, corporations per se, but with the market uh, model per se. Um, and I'm thinking here of t two examples. One recent example in news is news corporations. Now the purpose of news corporations is actually to function as part of the, I would suggest, as part of the fourth estate. That is, they're there to provide important information uh, and forums for people to, to provide comment in relation to the smooth function of a liberal democracy. And if they're not achieving that purpose, then there's a problem. Uh, and clearly there is a problem with news corporations, with news corporation uh, in particular in, in the UK. Um, and so uh, another example might be with uh, uh, incorporated legal practices. Uh, we need to understand what lawyers are there for and what legal firms are there to achieve. And whether or not um, incorporated legal practices is a good idea depends on whether or not it's a good way of achieving those purposes. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Certainly there, there looks to be a need to uh, restructure those kinds of organisations in that context. And I take it that things like uh, the establishing the position of a, as a solicitor director, for example, is, is one way of, achieve, of trying to achieve that. So the final point I'd make um, is this, that uh, we, need to we need to think in terms of the larger purposes. Uh, this is not actually about, it's about specific purposes for specific markets and specific forms of organisation. It's not actually about, by the way, co uh, a corporate social responsibility or stakeholder theory, which is far too amorphous, it seems to me, to achieve uh, these purposes. Thanks. Okay, Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Lynn, uh, would you like to comment on any of those comments before we open to the floor? I would, of course, like to comment on all of them, but <laughs> I also want to hear from uh, the folks who were kind enough to attend this morning. So I'll try and keep it brief. Wonderful comments. Uh, basically, I agree with 85% of, of what I've heard, so I'm just going to touch on a few things. Um, it's very interesting to me, and I do see this pattern in the United States as well, Real directors and real corporate lawyers, if you press them, will say, you know, the duties are owed to the firm. They're not owed to shareholders per se. So at least in the United States, the pressure for maximizing shareholder value is coming, actually, it's almost external to the board. And so it's coming from, for example, in the United States, we did something dreadful in 1993. Our Congress changed the tax laws so that corporations could only deduct executive salaries over a million dollars if they were tied to objective performance metrics. This was just a dreadful decision and, and in many ways responsible for much of what we're suffering today. Done with the best of intentions, the idea was to incentivize executives to do a better job for shareholders. Uh, clearly didn't work out the way, the way we had intended. Um, uh, another source of external pressure, in the UK at least, is the takeovers panel and their takeovers rules. Uh, so the problem is, as a director, you can't think for the long term. If you've got a bidder showing up saying, oh, guess what? We're going to offer a premium price to your shareholders, and then after your shareholders sell out, we're going to bust up the firm. So there are these external pressures on directors that I think we have to take very uh, significantly. Um, the other thing I think that is absolutely essential, I meant to get to it, but I got so carried away. As you can tell, I get very enthusiastic about these topics. I just find it interesting. And I, I also get enthusiastic because, to me, it's fixable. You know, we're our own worst enemy. If we can come up with the right sorts of laws and the right sorts of rules, we can actually make things better. I get excited about that in a rather Adam Smith sort of way. But one of the, our next job is to do what Greg Medcalf is inviting us to do, which is to unpack this notion of the shareholder and understand that different shareholders have different interests. And I think what's been missed there, and what I try to highlight in the book is, the problem is, Different investors are not playing on a level playing field. Um, in particular, diversified investors, by virtue of their sheer diversification, 
tend not to get involved in corporate governance and tend not to be in a position to protect themselves from the problem of external costs. It's the undiversified investors, the hedge funds in particular, that have undue influence. They're, they're, they're carrying, they're punching above their weight, seriously. And it's also the hedge funds that have these short-term interests. To a hedge fund, if you hang on to something for three years, that's a long-term investment, right? So, so one of the job that, that Greg has to face is how can you restructure the playing field so that the diversified investors, the long-term investors, the pro-social investors, the moms and pops are in a position to catch the ear of the directors in the same way that a non-diversified, short-term, deeply involved activist hedge fund can. Um, and finally, on the purpose of the, of the corporation, I'll actually write it even more broadly than Seamus does. It, it seems to me we have to understand that business is subsidized by society. Business can't exist without public subsidization. I mean, you know, the, the illegal drug dealers, they have to run a business without public subsidization. But legal businesses, they get subsidized because the public pays to enforce their contracts. They get subsidized because they're given the great gift of limited liability. Business only exists because the public wants it to exist and subsidizes it, which seems to me that at the end of the day, business has to have a public purpose. And the public purpose is, I would, I would actually put it to generate a surplus. A business that is not generating a surplus, is not creating wealth for society, is not a business that deserves public subsidy. Now, once you're generating wealth, I become, as a good economist, somewhat more indifferent, perhaps, than I should be to who gets the surplus. Ah, you can give it to the shareholders. You can give it to the employees. You can give it to the creditors. You know, my view is that's above my pay grade. But what I am concerned about is that when the pursuit of shareholder value leads business to stop generating a surplus. And when I see the pursuit of shareholder value essentially leading shareholders themselves to push for blowing up the business in the interest of short-term profit, then I think business isn't doing what we collectively want it to do. And it's time to stop subsidizing it. So, so I'm going to quit right there because you know, I think we've got some really broad topics here. And I'm sure there are people in the room who have some opinions. Um, yeah, look, I, I actually agree with you. I, I think the issue for companies is that I think these days, if, if you are being attacked by a hedge fund, then I think companies need to be more proactive about putting out their long-term message. And I think companies have got to think about using multi-channel communication. They've got to think about using new media. You've got now with you know Twitter and with Facebook, you've actually got great channels where you can actually really uh, push out your message and get your message across. It's not just on the exchange. So I do think they've got to think about being more proactive and putting out their message where they are being being challenged. Yeah. The second thing, I, and I actually I want to make the point is, I completely agree on ethics. Mm -hmm. I, I think, frankly, think we've got to do a lot more work in schools and right. elsewhere in mm -hmm. ethics, uh, frankly. Uh, and I often say that you know self-regulation is most importantly is going beyond the law, but particularly thinking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. being, thinking about ethics and doing the right thing. So I completely, yeah. I think if we had more ethics, uh, I think things would, you would actually probably need a lot more, less intervention. Uh, and and I, I can't agree more. And actually, um, I'll shamelessly plug my other book. It's called Cultivating Conscience, How Good Laws Make Good People. And, and the basic theme is that, um, you know, there's a tendency when things go wrong to think it's a matter of good apples and bad apples good people and bad people, and that's not the way it works at all. Um, uh, you can, ethics are something you can create, but they have to be supported by the institution. And so I think one of the great challenges, if you want a thriving institution, is to figure out how to structure them so that they support ethics instead of undermining them. I agree. And, and what specific role then should ASIC as a regulator play to ensure that <laughs> the ethical framework is improved? Well, you know, look, for an example, recently, uh, you know, I chaired the uh, advisory panel on uh, standards and ethics for financial advisors. And I think there, you know, we've come up with a, a recommendation to the government that I think starts to address how you embed ethics in the financial advice profession, for example. So, because let's face it, as I said, you know, I think at the end of the day, if it goes beyond, if you think about it, it's about trust and confidence of investors. And if, if investors 
uh, and consumers can feel that, that the parties they're dealing with will do the right thing. It's not about just strictly complying with the letter of the law, but it's about what's behind it. I yeah. think that, as I say, that's, I think that's a good thing for us as a regulator because you know, it actually means that you know, we actually leverage well what we're doing because if people are doing the right thing, then there's probably less for us to do, frankly. So I yeah. think it's a very important tool. Yeah. John, do you have a comment? Oh, just two points. One is I'd like to hear a discussion about what happens when you have a society which makes 702, I think it is currently, state laws making directors personally liable. Um, and when you have a system which makes directors mm -hmm. criminally liable for mm -hmm. what I'd call um, just being a director. I mean, that's called, you know, accessorial mm -hmm. liable, what have you. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does that do to the long-term um, willingness of directors to take on positions? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what does that do to talented, experienced yeah. people um, who may have, you know, many other options. And mm -hmm. we're getting surveys from our own members mm -hmm. on this area, which is um, being a director, the risk reward, perhaps, um, despite how ethical you may be and despite how, mm -hmm. how good you might be, um, is becoming an area which is not as attractive as it should be for the rest of society. So mm -hmm. I think in Australia we have a, a, a sort of a different model, which is the limited liability company is becoming unlimited for directors but maybe for nobody else. Um, and I think that's a big issue in Australia. And the other aspect, I yeah. think, which is really important, um, is that you, you train people, as you do in law, in ethics and, 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 and very nature of being trained in law is, is part of that. Um, but the very nature of being a, a director and undertaking the courses, for example, that we run are, are basically around those issues. You know, who mm -hmm. are you there for? What are you, what are you trying to do? Mm -hmm. What are the conflicts of interest? And why ethical behaviour is so important. So I think, you know, there are two themes which, you know, I'd really quite like to hear than okay. anyone else. I mean, the, the idea of, of, of this, the panel was to kick-start a debate and it was, certainly wasn't planned that they would all agree with Professor Stodd's analysis. Uh, I mean, uh, f f so in, in terms of the audience, is there, is there a broad agreement with, 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 with the analysis or is there anyone who, who, who would regard this as being flawed, would like to challenge it? If you go back to the 60s and 70s, when you invested in a company, and, and bearing in mind you may have bought the share from somebody else, but let's assume you have invested directly. When you bought a share, essentially that capital was invested in what was predominantly physical capital. Mm -hmm. So when you invested General Motors or, or General Dynamics, and, and Friedman may have got a, you know, he may have been a victim of his time. If we look at the value chain at the moment, increasingly value in the value chain derives from ideas and brands. Mm -hmm. In an experiential society, mm -hmm where you paid three and four dollars for a cup of coffee and a thousand dollars for a phone, mm -hmm. the bulk of that value comes from the idea and the brand. Mm -hmm. Net operating cash flow is a very poor leading indicator of the value of a brand right. or an idea right. because those ideas and brands are subject to impairment immediately, mm -hmm. as in the case of BP. Mm -hmm. When you ran the South Sea Island, South Sea Company, and you invested in a franchise to exploit, you know, cocoa oil yeah. or something, it was a physical asset which couldn't explode right. or implode immediately. Mm -hmm. The challenge with the modern corporation is that it is subject to enormous impairment on its key assets, which mm -hmm. are ideas and brands. Mm -hmm. And those are the companies that are able to communicate the value of those brands long term right. in the form yeah. of compelling rhetoric mm -hmm. and underlying sure. information mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. get subjected to mm -hmm. marauding anarchy of the marketplace. Right. So the argument may be is that shareholder value is not so much that the flaws with shareholder value, it's that the mechanism that we use, which is net operating cash flows discounted, mm -hmm. are a poor leading indicator of that. Mm -hmm. The final observation, I think, John Colvin's point, the average share might be held for 20 minutes, but the median share isn't. Right, yeah. yeah. And the other issue is around um, shareholder value maximization. We may not see evidence of it mm -hmm. because directors aren't doing that. Directors are satisficing, and therefore you're not getting the outcome that mm -hmm. you think you get because they're not looking for that outcome, right. they're actually satisficing. Trying to go backwards, um, but on the evidence point, the way they test this is they look at uh, rule changes, governance rules within the firm, and so they try and see if you institute a rule change. For example, if you go from a staggered board where a third of the directors are elected each year to a non-staggered board, thereby making it easier for a hedge fund to come in and challenge, does that improve share value? And so that's the way they're measuring it. And, and I think I, so I'll actually defend the lack of any empirical results as being significant because without regard to what the directors want to do, you would think that making it easier to remove them 
would promote greater shareholder value if the principal problem were that shareholders didn't have enough control. Um, I love your example of brand names. Um, and in fact, if you look at the industries where corporations first arose, that's exactly the sort of economic project where you see corporations being used most often, where you need to make a long-term commitment to something that if you can't hold it together, the value evaporates very quickly. Actually, I, I think a brand name and a railroad are very similar. Uh, the thing about a railroad is in order to get any money out of it, you need to have all of it. You need to have both of the tracks. You need to have the beginning and the end. <laughs> you need to have the rail, you know, the rail cars. And it's the same thing with a brand name. It's a long-term investment. And indeed, um, if, you can, if you can get a short-term increase in price um, by doing things that erode the value of the brand name, but this doesn't show up in market price immediately, uh, yeah, that's going to be a very tempting opportunity for someone to fish with dynamite. We've actually just seen this in the US. Um, we have a very famous hedge fund raider, Carl Icahn, who went after Clorox, which is one of the oldest and most established uh, you know, bleach brands in the United States. And of course, what he wanted to do was break it up and bust it up in the hopes that he would get a temporary share price um, uh, increase. Uh, Clorox was able to fend him off, in part because the United States doesn't have a takeovers panel. But, uh, but it, was a, it, was a, it was a bitter fight, and it's an example of the sorts of pressures that uh, companies that are trying to develop brand names for the future have to resist. Well, th there are two things that are, are, are semi-formed thoughts that I had yeah. that I'd like to throw into this mix. Um, the first is whether or not, perhaps because many of us are lawyers, we jump too often to legal solutions to problems. And um, I've heard it a lot in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And as a result of seeking legal solutions to lots of problems, mm -hmm. we have, for instance, reverse onus of proof around forward-looking statements mm -hmm. for people who want to tell the market what their plan mm -hmm. is, which is producing for many companies, um, and in particular for directors, a very perverse incentive to say as little as they Pass can mm -hmm. um, because they're going to get sued. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder about whether or not we do need to look more to the sorts of solutions that, in fact, people like the Takeovers Panel, the ASX Corporate Governance Council, and other such organisations which look to principles mm -hmm. rather than to simple, direct legal solutions, mm -hmm. where we have created a so much more complex society mm -hmm. than we had 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's the next thing I want to move on to. Because so much of this conversation, at very many levels, could have been held 50 years ago. Yes in talking about the form of director's duties, mm -hmm. um, the fact of a corporation. But in fact, what we now have is corporations of a size that are not only too big to fail, but in many cases, too big to manage. Mm -hmm. So quite contrary to what you're saying about the role of the takeovers panel in the UK, yeah. we may have created through looking at the simple um, rationalist models, yeah. organisations that are so big mm -hmm. that we can't rationally manage them without mm -hmm. modelling, mm -hmm. which involves a whole range of assumptions that you only find out too late were wrong. Were wrong, yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of the GFC leads you to perhaps some of that analysis. Mm -hmm. um, the case of only having four large auditing firms in the world leads to that mm -hmm. anal analysis. Mm -hmm. Were you a government 20 years ago looking at some of those mergers, knowing what you know now, you might have said no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think some of our analysis needs to go back to um, the people, mm -hmm. not the models, mm -hmm. uh, to principles rather than simple legal solutions. Mm -hmm and indeed to do some unpicking of some of the laws that we now have right. yeah. and rethinking around mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. to allow franker conversations mm -hmm. um, in markets and among people about prospects for firms. Thanks very much. Justin, can I yeah. just make a comment about that? I, I'd add one other thing, and that is I think we've moved into a period in Australia where the articulation of policy and the making of good law 
has uh, fallen away. I think that we see as lawyers again and again, if you take your example of the reverse onus of proof type mm -hmm. provision, uh, not enough thoughtfulness about the policy making process and not enough thoughtfulness about the actual laws we have and the new laws we're making. Uh, I mean, say so th there doesn't seem to be enough time and enough close consideration mm -hmm. given to a lot of our lawmaking mm -hmm. uh, about what it really is going to do. Uh, David. Can I just make a quick follow up to your point too? Uh, it's not always best to think about this as generating legal solutions to mm. problems or indeed market solutions mm. to problems. The word trust is, I think, extraordinarily important. Mm. Uh, the, the, if you ask, and, and this relates to your admirable attempt to put our problem in a simple way by thinking of the firm as something that generates surplus. Yeah. Think carefully about what that means. You are, I'm, imagining driving through the city of Bristol, which I know well, past the great Bristol Hospital. And you ask, do the doctors in that hospital think that their task is to generate surplus for the Bristol Hospital? And of course not. Mm. Uh, uh, so if we're going to go with the surplus idea, uh, they're generating surplus well beyond the hospital. They're not doing something which you can capture in a market solution. You, guess what Adam Smith's other great book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, is all about building connections, that, building a health service that people trust in a community that respects its doctors. Mm. Those two words, trust and respect. And those, um, a, 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 and I come back to my professionalization idea, I think those th professionalization, trust, respect and integrity of those that work in firms, the more these things are possible, the less we will need legal solutions. Uh, the law being there is necessary, but as, as one of you said, the more these things are important, the less we will end up colliding with the law and needing mm. to fix it that way. Yeah. Okay. Dean Sanders. Great. In, in fact, that's a, that's a great introduction to, to my topic. Dean Sanders, FPA and Chief Professional Officer for this particular that particular community. Sorry for the voice, but um, I want to tease out that theme a little bit too because I, I, I thoroughly support uh, the pr Professor Stout's hypothesis around the idea that the corporation is almost the perfect vehicle of disaggregation. And I think, in fact, that's that's what we're really talking about here. Uh, I'm hearing, I, 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 I step away though from the idea of legal solution, as I think most people are, mm -hmm. and through even the idea of better law. I think we argue that there is such a thing as better law. I actually am concerned that, in fact, what we're really trying to respond to is the concept of disaggregation. We've all, we have all disaggregated our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We all assume it's somebody else's issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, further law yeah. actually just inculcates that further mm -hmm. because we create greater legal professionals, we, we, a community of compliance professionals, <laughs> somebody else to be responsible for administering the law. Mm -hmm. So I'm deeply attracted to Professor Vine's idea about professionalisation, which happens right. to be an area of personal interest mm -hmm. because it is about the idea of how we hold each other accountable. Yeah. And I think that the duty to the corporation as a director misunderstands the duty to hold each other director yeah, yeah, responsible, yeah, 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 yeah. which I think is part of the challenge we have in our, in our mm -hmm. corporate governance structures. But, but fa fabulous, uh, fabulous discussion. Thank you. Right. Just Very difficult. So as I'm, I'm walking over, it seems a churlish come so close to Christmas. But, uh, but I mean, is, is it part of the lawyer's role to deconstruct or, or, or um, forget about fables, John? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think there are many fables out there, and I think we do. And is shareholder value one of them? Well, I think it has been deconstructed to a large degree in Australia in recent times. Uh, mm -hmm. it, from a lawyer's point of view, as to in terms of how the duty is to be framed. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I'm not sure about the actual practice of it. And I think right. there's a lot of evidence that the shareholder does reign. Mm -hmm. my, my big problem is who, who are they? Um, mm -hmm. these, you know, I mean, say quite often they're really investment managers who are operating under a mandate who tell a custodian how to vote the shares. Um, mm. And those shares are moving around as I think, I'm not sure who mentioned, you know, they're being lent or they're being borrowed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole idea of the share is, is sort of being blown up 
and the real interest is the ultimate person who has the economic interest in the, in the outcomes. It doesn't get a vote. It doesn't get a vote, and, and quite often is Or if he does get it, often doesn't bother to cast it. Yeah. Well, yes. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, the movement of democracy in, in, in terms of uh, more involvement of the big uh, superannuation funds and things like that, having regard to the interests of their members, yeah. is quite an important one. Yeah. It's happened in Canada, it hasn't happened mm -hmm. here. But I mean, I, as I said, I think the emergence of basically economic, uh, sorry, of social rep responsibility reporting, environmental reporting, you know, the whole sustainability report, you know, this whole thing, I, I think that's a massive change in thinking that, that's happening at the moment. I, I think that's sort of consistent yeah. with a lot of what we're talking about. Yeah. So I, I think we're there. I think we're it's there. A, it's, it's sounds actually, like you're ahead of us. I think, I think, well, no, I think, I think the world is there. I think that... that, that I think it, we're potentially there. Well, I think, yeah. well, I think no, if you look at... No, we're not there in the US yet. I hate oh, to be okay. the bearer of bad news. We're not there in the US <laughs> but I, yet. But I do think, you know, you ask, as I said, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, this, you know, sustainability reporting yeah. and even auditing of sustainability reporting. So... And I think that's reflecting a, a, a community expectation, frankly. Yeah. I, I have to say, Greg, I, I know you have to, to, yeah, to, to, to leave. Uh, and Before I'm to accountable to. I'm enthusiastic about that actual result because if it's more reporting and more direct a liability for getting any of the reports wrong, you're going to have exactly the mm. same problem mm. that Cathy's yeah. already mm. raised. Mm. And you're actually not yeah. going to move the morals and the mm. ethics. Mm. Uh, but if, uh, if it's a, if it's a mm. thought process mm. and a principles based mm. issue about this and what's discussed, then I think it's a very good. Well, I, I, sorry, I, I'm not looking at mandating it actually. No. <laughs> uh, no, just in case I, before I, you lift. No, yeah. I, sorry. Actually, as I said, I think I think it's actually reflecting. I think companies are responding to community expectations, and yeah. some of the community expectations are what they're probably getting back from institutional shareholders, uh, and being you know more accountable, not just focusing on on price or whatever. So I think I think we are seeing a change. That yeah. That's all. You have to okay. excuse me. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. Great. Good to meet Steve you. Steve Mark. Okay. Uh, Steve Mark, Legal yeah. Services Steve Commissioner. Mark. Just Take a care. short comment. Uh, I remember in 2008 when we had the first great financial meltdown, um, there was a, a wonderful moment when uh, our then Prime Minister, uh, Kevin Rudd, was over talking to Gordon Blair in the UK and they came out with a joint statement that they said what we really needed in regulating financial markets to bring back family values. <laughs> 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 when I think about my family that would be <laughs> extremely <laughs> frightening. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I'd like to say about this is that, that uh, when we look at the concept of professionalism, the concept of ethics, um, there, there is one little model, it's a very small one and Seamus mentioned it a bit, um, that, that that we can actually think about, and that is that the fact that there are now two corporations listed on the stock exchange in Australia that have the primary duty to the community, not the shareholder, not even to the entity, and those are both law firms. This is, to <laughs> some extent, some people would find this very frightening, <laughs> but actually it could be an incredibly yes. interesting model for a different type of regulation not only a type of regulation, but a type of thinking about the role that the directors of an entity play. So then Slater and Gordon and Integrated Holdings, you have the primacy of the court, where the directors of those publicly lifted companies have their primary duty to the court, their secondary duty to their client, the tertiary duty to the shareholder. And if there's a co and they all state that if there's a clash between corporations law and the Legal Profession Act, the Legal Profession Act will prevail, leaving aside the small constitutional issue there. There's a, there's a really interesting concept behind that, which is that they have their duty to something bigger. And that is the whole basic concept of professionalism. To be a professional, you have to have a duty to the community, to the, yeah. to the public. Right. It's not just about having a specialized ethical knowledge. It's about your duty to the community. And there are very few professions. If we make directors a profession in the same way that lawyers are a profession, perhaps that's, that's getting somewhere along that path. It's very interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, now the regulators left. Can I ask the panel? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, John. Uh, can I ask the panel, do they think the, reg the regulators are irresponsible in allowing securities markets to allow publicly traded corporations 
to trade with constitutions which give absolute power to the directors to corrupt themselves, their business and the system by having in the regards to managing their own conflicts of interest, which we are told directors should not have conflicts of interest. Okay. But as soon as you have a single board where the governance powers are combined with management powers, yeah. directors are forced to have the conflict of interest of determining their own pay, their own nomination, their own remuneration, and selecting and paying the judge of their accounts, which are basically an unethical, unethical structures, which could be eliminated by the separation of governance powers into a separate board from the management powers. So my thesis is regulators are irresponsible in allowing publicly traded corporations to have directors with absolute power. Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree? No, probably <laughs> not. But I need to think about it some more. Um, the United States, and of course that's the model I'm most familiar with, um, one of the most interesting things about the United States is that, first of all, it was the nation that, that first and most strongly developed what I think of as the truly public corporation, meaning a corporation without a controlling shareholder. Very unique structure, not common in the rest of the world. How did that happen? It happened because, I hate to say this, God bless them, the plaintiff's lawyers were able to bring class actions and derivative actions, and they didn't have to pay fees if they lost. And what that meant was the duty of loyalty in the United States is very rigorously enforced. So in the United States, it's actually not true that directors can use their powers to line their own pockets. They really can't. If a director enters a self-interested transaction, uh, they'll, be a, they'll be dragged into court immediately. And if it's not on fair terms, they'll be sued successfully. So in a way, we've evolved something that ap actually operates more independently than what you see in boards of directors in the rest of the world. I'm a little fond of it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have room for improvement. But, but it's, a, it's a different experience from the rest of the world. Our directors really are pretty clean in the sense that they can't use their director's positions to make themselves wealthy, which is why they have room to think about other things, like professionalism, if we can just encourage them to do so. Well, okay. I'll, I'm happy to comment on that. I, I think that um, one of the things that's underestimated in Australia and, and probably the United States from the comments is that we have an incredibly good system of uh, training gov uh, directors and also I think at the top level of our companies um, they're about as good as anywhere else in the world. Um, in fact there's a good argument to say they're probably better than anywhere else in the world. Ethical issues are a c constant issue in boards. Um, doing the right thing is a constant debate in boards. Um, we have more laws, as I said, Shan, to make sure directors are liable and prosecuted mm -hmm. than probably any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's probably dysfunctional because mm -hmm. the end argument, I think, that you're putting is that we must do something about it. Um, the best thing we can possibly do is attract the best very people, the best people. I don't mean that just in terms of economics, legal analysis and business, but in terms of, you know, the best in terms of ethics, morals and, and also, you know, judgment. Mm -hmm. And business judgment is critical because the business judgment that directors make on a you know nearly a weekly basis is weighing up all the various things we've been talking about. Um, if you make that decision, is that going to be a reputational issue for the com for the company later on, even if there's you know large profits to be made? Um, I would suggest that most companies in Australia would always just about always take the view um, that that's not the right way to go. Um, it's I agree with what you're saying, but the point is you're overloading the duties of directors. We heard this comment that corporations are getting too big to manage. Yeah. Why overload the duties and add extra liabilities on them like the Centro case? And whereby separating, decomposing decision making labour, so you get away from the conflict. So I agree with everything you're saying. Oh, right. And but I agree with what Lynn is saying, but except that in Australia you don't know what to do, there's no transparency, you don't know the law says that, but what they do in practice. We could always make life very yeah, simple well, by getting rid of the publicly suppose, listed companies. I suppose company. the argument is <laughs> there's a lot of law on that and there's a lot of discussion a lot of, about what is the role of a director mm. and that ebbs and flows with tides and issues, um, which is also there's a lot of discussion about that. So if you're saying that, you know, um, people shouldn't look at directors, especially non-executive directors, and treat them as managers, you've got absolutely 100% support. Um, if you're talking about you know, what is the role of a director on a given day, I mean, I think most of the boards in the last year, the last couple of years, 
They've probably worked harder than they've ever worked and they've probably turned to, you know, I mean, you hear about REM committee meetings, NOM committee meetings, mm -hmm. audit and risk committee meetings, meeting every day, you know, for, you know, long periods of time. Um, everyone in this audience probably knows about some aspects yeah. of that. So that ebbs and flows. I have a, a, you know, a pretty strong view, personally, that trying to draw lines um, other than the general principle lines is quite dysfunctional. Okay, I think at that we'll, we'll leave the formal proceedings. Uh, coffee is available uh, outside, but at this stage I'd, I'd just like to thank uh, Professor Lynn Stott from UCLA uh, and for our distinguished thank panel, you. John thank Morgan, James so Miller, yeah. John Coven, David Barnes.